In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. All right, good? All right, sweet, good. Let's go. Bibles out, Genesis 1, boom. Or if you brought like your Torahs, that works as well. This is going to be good. Everyone say Tav. Yeah, Tav. Okay, it means, it means good. So like instead of, you know, screaming out amen like you normally do, um, today what you can do is just scream out Tav, Tav. Um, or you could do like they do it at Bethel and be like, oh, so tough, Darren, so tough, so tough. If you're from uh, L.A., you can be like, man, that dope tough, okay? I made that up. Like, tough means good, to, okay, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> man, this word is dope, t- okay, all right, good, all right, so that, that's going to be good. All right, uh, so tough, Darren, so tough, tough, good, okay, is good. Um, all right, you look great. Genesis 1, about a sheet, okay, in the first epoch of, of time, okay, not, not, not in a point of time, this is, this is a period of time. So in the first period of time, Elo, Elohim, mighty God, okay, the one who's deserving of all of our worship and attention and adoration, mighty God, yeah. So before there was anything, there was someone. Before there was anything, there was him, okay, so Barashit Elohim bara. okay, bara means he created, he brought something from uh, out of nothing into, into being, right, like something just amazing with such intricate, you say bara, what does that mean, it means like divine design being made manifest, creation, so Barashit Elohim bara. okay, okay, so um, in, in the beginning, okay, there was him, okay, and what did he do? He created, okay, and where did he create? He created in the Kosek, which is in, in, in the dark, okay? Um, so it's, it, it's, it's this idea, Kosek is also a metaphor throughout scripture for even things such as entities of, of, of evil, okay, or, or, or even destruction, okay? You see Kosek, and you're just like, oh, oh that's, yeah, yeah, it makes you a little nervous, okay? So, um, uh, but it wasn't just Kosek. Um, uh, where, where, he did, where did he create? He created in the Kosek and the, and the Tohu Vavohu, okay? So in the Kosek and the Tohu Vavohu, which is, which in Hebrew rhymes, okay? So he, you always hear a lot of Tohu Vavohu in, in Hebrew rap, which probably um, only... Only I'm probably a scholar in this room of, of such things, but um, I am teaching a master class, okay? See me after the service, okay? Um, so we see in the, in the beginning, okay, is mighty God, okay? There, there he is, and what does he do? He creates the heavens and the earth. Where does he create the heavens and the earth? He creates it in the Kosek, in the darkness, and in the Toho, Tohu Vavohu, which is in, in the chaos, okay? It's, 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 in, the, it's in literally the non, a nonsensical um, realm. It's, it's just... In, in, he, where is he in crazy town okay and and it says there in the chaos waters he is it actually says that the spirit of god the word spirit is is the hebrew word ruach okay which is which is not the spit of god it's the breath of god it's the it's the presence of god are you guys tracking with me so here you go in the in the darkness and in the in, and in an atmosphere that resembles that of the line on black friday to walmart there is god hovering in the midst of the chaos Just like you, you know, just so you can get $15 off on that big screen. He was right there in the middle of it, brooding, 
Hope you got it. Okay, brooding, hovering, waiting, and then all of a sudden comes the sound. What sound? The voice. The voice of who? The voice of Elohim. The voice of, of Elohim, which is a, a plural of voices. It's the voice of the Son, the Father, and the Spirit. The three in one, okay? It's the voice of, 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 the, of, the, of the dream team, the divine community of heaven. He speaks, and he says, let there be be light and there is light and God sees the light and he sees that it is Tav. Everyone say Tav. Yeah, the, 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 this means that it's, that it's beautiful, yeah, but it's also effective and efficient. And it is effective and efficient as well as beautiful. Isn't this an amazing word, this word beautiful? Okay, yes, that's beautiful, but is it useful? Well, if God created it, the answer is yes. Why? Because it's tav. And it's not just tav. It's so tav, Darren. So tav. So God looks and he says, and it was tav. It was pleasing and useful. And he affirmed it and he sustained it. And then what did he do? He, ah, he carved it. Now, this is something that your Sunday school teacher didn't hit on, but every time God creates in the first two days, he creates, he speaks, he blesses it, and then he carves it. He divides it. He separates. He, he brings division to his own creation. Isn't that crazy? Well, it's every day so di divisive and division. Division is bad. Division is bad. Division is bad. Not all the time. Division's only bad when you're bringing division to what is good. Division is good when you bring it to that which is bad. So what's God doing? God's bringing order out of the chaos. How does he do that? He divides the chaos. Selah. Go ahead, you can breathe out. It's all right. All right, good. So he separates the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and then the, the darkness, he called it night, and there was evening, and there was morning. So on the first day, God created morning, and evening, and morning, and evening, and he created the rhythm, the top, the... Morning, evening, morning, wicked, wicked tough. The rhythm. Because you don't build a symphony unless you first have a rhythm. You don't build anything unless you first have a foundation. Day one, let there be light. The light was the foundation. Without Jesus, you have no light. Without no light, you have no foundation. And you can't build on nothing if you don't have Jesus. So you start with day one. I'm going to create something. Create it with Jesus. <laughs> I'm not even mad yet. In, 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 in day one, it, 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 this, is the, this is the most incredible thing, is that you're going to see patterns. I love patterns. I think patterns are interesting. Whenever I see a pattern that's effective, that tells me I don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you've got a pattern and it's working for you, baby, I'm going to steal your pattern. If you've got a pattern and it's not working for you, I'm not going to steal your pattern. But the pattern is this, that each day God speaks up. He shows up and he speaks up. Our country is the way that it is because the church has not shown up and the church has not spoken up. Day one, God says. Day two, God says. Day three, God says. Honey, I think we've got a pattern. Day four, God says. Day five, God says. Day. Why does God always have to say something? Because God never does anything unless he first speaks it. Why? Because in the kingdom, this realm is activated by speech. God that includes Jesus never did anything unless he first declared it. So you can have all this destiny. You can have all this, I got all this destiny. It's all up in me. I got all this, I got all this future. I got all this hope. But, but nobody's seeing it. Nobody even knows about it. Why? Because you haven't declared it, right? So you got all these people that are bummed out and frustrated. Why? Because I got a dream. 
dream, I got a dream. I'm so depressed, it is not seen. Why? Because you never read your Bible. You never read that nothing gets created, nothing gets established unless it is first declared. If you're feeling it, if you're hosting it, if you're loving it, you've got to speak it. You've got to declare it. I remember when, when the Lord called me into um, ministry, I, I, I spoke, I, I, I declared. Now, I'll tell you something. Uh, there was once a period of time when I was, you're not going to believe this, but there was once a period of time when I was not a pastor. There was once a period of time that I had what's called a, a job. A job. Okay. I worked, I worked for a Babylonian company called Comcast. <laughs> and I was a Christian. But can I tell you something? I, I, told my, I told my employer, I told my boss, I said, hey, look, man, I don't know how long I'll be here. I don't know how long I'll work here. But you need to know that there will come a time when I leave because I've got a call to be a pastor. So I'm going to be doing my Bible schooling while I'm working for you. And this is what I told him. I said that while I'm on your team, I will be in, in, the, top, I will be in the top categories for sales. I'll be one of your top earners. I said, uh, but you need to know this. My intent for working for you is to make as much money as I possibly can while I'm working for you. Because the day will come when that may not be the case. <laughs> I, told my, I just told my employer right off the bat. I said, look, I've got to call the ministry and I'm going to be a pastor. And you know, he said, great. He knew there wasn't going to be a conflict because I made a commitment that I was going to give him my best. And I did. There was only one time he had to call me up. Because my numbers weren't where they should be. And um, I apologized. I said that would never happen again. And you know what? It never happened again. What's the point? The point is, if you've got a destiny, which you have, trust me, you're not a mistake. God created you. There's something big in you. And here's the thing. Um, you're not doing any favors and not talking about what God has put inside of you. He has put, God has carried something in his heart. He's deposited it in your heart. And when you see it, you need to sing it. I got something in me. I know my identity. I've got a destiny. You might find me annoying, but I'm going somewhere do you want to go with me look at the person next to you say I'm going somewhere do you want to go with me because the people in your life they need to hear from you they need to hear from you what do they need to hear they need to hear what is in you whatever is inside of you you need to begin speaking it why because if you don't speak it I promise you you will not see it if you don't speak it I promise you you will not see it and the reason why you have not seen it is because you have not spoken it on day one he spoke it on day two he spoke it on day three he spoke it he spoke it he saw it he blessed it he separated it he brought identity and he said it is tough I'll tell you what's inside of you it's tough but it needs to get exported. I'm telling you, every single person in this room right now has a destiny that needs to get exported. And I'm telling you, it's Tav. And here's what that means. It's useful and it's beautiful. And it's beautiful and it's useful. Back to the word. Verse 6. Second day. God said... Let there be an expanse. Now, I like Brian Simmons. Brian Simmons, in the Passion Translation, he says, um, he just says it the, 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 how it is. Let there be a dome. The Hebrew word is rakia. That was last week. It was amazing. So amazing. If you weren't here, you missed out. You'll never really hear it again. You know, we, we erased it from the internet to create value because we're the scarcity. There's value, so you won't be able to find it. Um, just kidding. It's there. It's everywhere. It's worthless. So God says, let there be a dome, which is... A, 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 a rakia, a, a, okay, we'll just keep reading, in the midst of the waters, and it separated the waters below the expanse. And from the waters, from the expanse, um, God made the expanse of the sky and separated, everyone say separated, 
Okay, the waters which were under the expanse from the waters that were above the rakia, above the dome. And just as it was as he commanded, and God called the rakia heaven, and there was evening and there was morning on the second day. So on day one, God said, let there be light. The light brought forth a rhythm. He carved it and he separated it. There was morning and there was evening. And you're going to hear that with each day. God creates, he speaks, he blesses it. He says, it is, it is tov. And then it ends, there's evening and there's morning. Evening and morning. Day two, let there be a rakia, which brings a separation of the waters, part of the waters go up, part of the waters go down, we've got the sky above, we've got the sea below, okay, and God blesses it, and he carves it, and you see, what God is doing is he's creating this womb by which he's going to bring forth light. Now that is what brings us to the third day, everybody say third day, and this is our text for today. Now, thank God for the third day. Because if it hadn't been for the third day, we would all have to be very, we'd all have to be basically created in the image and likeness of Michael Phelps. If it wasn't for the third day, we would be swimming nonstop. Because all we've got is water, water, and atmosphere. So just trust me on this one. Thank God, okay, for the third day, okay? And God said, oh, there, there it is again. Look at God. He's speaking up. He's showing up. He's speaking up. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. Now, I like David, okay? David is this prophet minstrel who goes into these high places of praise and then begins to get revelation while he's singing, okay? Now, when David is singing to the Lord in Psalm 104, he begins to bring about revelation into the third day. And I want you to see how David sees this third day playing out. He says to the Lord, you covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. So it's almost like you got all these waters, but they got ears. And then God comes and rebukes the waters, and, they, and they, they scatter like mice. And at the sound of your thunder, they scurry away, the waters. At that same point, the mountains begin to animate and begin to come up and out of the ground, up and out of the water. And as the mountains are coming up and stretching up towards the skies, and as the waters are scurrying away, valleys began to sink down low. And David says that this is the place that you have established for the valleys, the mountains, the waters. Here's God, again, bringing order out of chaos and putting everything in its right place. Then David proclaims, God, you have set a boundary for the waters that they may not cross over so that they uh, will not return to cover the earth. This is, this is, this is, this is phenomenal. That in, in, this, in this third day, light and darkness separate, bring, bring, come into the waters and separate the waters. Now we've got this womb. And then in this place, land and earth begin to come up and begin to carve out into the skies. And then begin to carve down to create the valleys. Begin to carve out the boundaries where water will be allowed to go and where it cannot grow and go on the third day. Now, when I drove to the service today with, with Peter, my son, I, that's why I call him, by the way, Peter, my son. We were, we were driving to the, to the church, and we saw um, what I called, as a child, Mountain Rainier. Okay, so it wasn't Mount Rainier, it was Mountain Rainier. So we were driving to church today, and we saw Mountain Rainier. Here's what's fascinating about Mountain Rainier. That when you see that mountain, or you see Mount Baker, Mount Adams, the Olympic Mountains, um, when you see these things, you are seeing the result of the proclamation of God from the third day, because on the third day, Mountain Rainier began to come up out of the ground and began to stretch forth up into the, high, the higher parts of the Rakia. The mountains began coming up and carving their way up into the heavens. 
When you look at Mount Rainier, you are seeing what took place on the third day. Mount Rainier or any of the mountains, any of the valleys, any of these things take you back to what God spoke into being on the third day. Mountains are so tough. They're so tough. Mountains, they, they cover 26.5% of, of the earth. In fact, out of 237 countries, 197 countries include mountains. Now, here's the thing. Here's, okay, I know what you're thinking. I, I, you're, you're thinking, okay, yeah, they're so tall, right? So they look cool. They're, they're majestic, but they're beautiful, but how are they functional? Yeah, well, thanks for asking. So mountains, okay, are, are actually our water towers. So God has provided actual literal water towers for the majority of the countries on his earth. Why? Because he created the earth with life in mind, with creating and sustaining life in mind. In fact, 60 to 80 percent of all fresh water on our planet comes because of these water towers that God created that are functional and efficient, but they are also beautiful. That is why I just don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I mean, when you look at the high-powered telescopes that we have right now that can look out into the cosmos, at all of these planets, at all of these places, and the whole time they're looking for life on other planets, right? They're looking and looking, and, and, and they can't find, like, these, like these, these planets, even if they were to put life on these planets, they would incinerate, they would burn up. Like, the only way that they're going to be able to get life on Mars is to completely terraform the planet, and, um, which they think they can do, but they would literally have to manipulate the fabric of the planet in order to sustain life. And in the process, they're going to kill a lot of people. So the only way that they could ever get life there is to kill a lot of things and people. But earth doesn't need to be manipulated. Why? Because the Lord has given us a planet that is perfect. No, no, no. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Do you even get that? Do you even get that for a second? We are living, there, trust me, there, trust me on this one. There are a lot of planets. I Googled it. There are like, there are like more planets than stinking numbers, okay? All right? And out of all the planets, and out, out of everywhere, okay, there's, a, there's at least 100 stinking planets. And out of all those planets, we are on the perfect one. Like, it is perfect. Like, he put water towers in almost every country and they look cool that's my god that's your god how much faith would you have to have to be like there's no god it just all like popped one day and all this was there and then there's like a like a little like some plasm and the plasm like like lost a leg and the leg became another plasm and those plasms started mating and created tadpole and that that tadpole when it popped out a leg became frog one day became monkey one day invented the internet yeah that what you're just all pop. That's the, that's the theory. It's called the big pop theory. Like, you can't believe in creationism. That's just dumb. Believe in the big pop theory where just all of a sudden one day everything just popped perfectly into existence. Half of the world's population depends on what? Mountains. <laughs> Why? They provide an ecosystem for survival, for not just water, but food and even energy. How many of you know, I didn't do this in the 9 o'clock, but since you guys are my favorite. <laughs> yeah, I, I do tell all the services that. We, we do um, Mount Ararat, right? This is the place where uh, Noah's Ark came down and sat down on what? On top of a mountain, Mount Sinai, kind of a big deal. God's crazy glory, fire presence comes down and cuts out and a covenant with Israel. God himself is sitting on what? A mountain. You have Mount uh, uh, Nebo, where uh, Mount, I like the name of that, um, uh, where Moses went up and uh, the Lord showed him the whole promised land. He got to see what would become um, Israel. 
right? Like Jerusalem, um, Mount, Mount Carmel, um, uh, where God shows his supremacy among the pagan people when Elijah comes in and confronts all the, remember Elijah came in and started making fun? He literally is mocking. People say, you can't, you can't mock and be a Christian. You wouldn't like Elijah. Uh, he's literally mocking the false prophets as the fire of God comes down and burns up wet wood. Where did that happen? On a mountain, right? You have Mount Moriah that would get rebranded and remarketed and become known as Mount Zion. Pretty big. Mount of, Mount of Olives, which is also the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Which becomes a, a or that was Mount Hermon, right? The Transfiguration. Anyways, my point is mountains are cool. That's my point. Mountains are really cool. If, if you go, if you tell your friends, I, well, we went to church today. What'd you learn? We learned that um, mountains are really cool. <laughs> and they're created on the third day. What else did you learn? Well, we learned a lot about dirt. That's coming up. I told our activation school, I said, well, I got to go preach a sermon on dirt. And somebody yelled, uh, was that you, Frank? Somebody yelled, keep it clean. And I was like, oh, hey. Okay. Verse 10. God called the dry land, everyone say dry land, earth, okay? And the waters were gathered together, and he called seas, and he saw that it was good. So we've got these rock form formations, and what does God put on these rock formations? He puts dry, dry earth or, or, or dirt, that God likes things to be clothed, okay? So God comes to these rocks, and he clothes them with, with dirt, with, with, with earth, earth. And the problem with the word dirt is immediately we think of things being dirty, right? But here's the thing about dirt. Dirt is the matter by which there can be life. Now, God, he thought of everything. He creates the rocks. He creates the valleys. He clothes it with, with, with earth. And here's the thing about earth. Earth begins to create itself why? Because dirt is actually a living organism. Why? Because it's composed of living organisms. So that when things live and then they die, they decompose and their matter returns back to the earth where it can make future life possible. Is, is this incredible? It's almost as if somebody brilliant was behind this. Okay? But not only that, dirt is so exciting. Dirt also, I hope you're taking notes, acts as a filter for water, right? Fresh water travels through the soil. It goes down, um, and, and as the water's going through the soil, it gets more pure and more pure until it gets to these underground um, aquifers, and that's where it's stored, and we drill our, our wells, and some of you have wells, and some of you have really great, really great water. This, these underground water wells, these big mountain water tanks, they weren't created by dudes. They were created by God because he loves you and I, and he wanted a place that would be the perfect place for his sons and daughters, our father, thought of everything because our father is so so tough now here's what's interesting that on this particular day on the third day it's different from the other days why because on on the other days god just said one thing god said let there be light right and god said let there be a rakia two days but on this particular day on the third day god actually does two executive orders he signs into power two different executive orders. So we see on this day, we've got the mountains, the valleys, we've got the earth. But then what does he do? He actually comes in to clothe what he just created. He even goes more extreme. Because God's going to say something again. When we get to verse 11, he speaks up. This is like each day, it says, and God said, right? Day two, and God said, but on day three, God says the God said twice. That brings us to verse 11. And then God said, let the land burst forth with growth, plants that bear seeds of their own kind and every variety of fruit tree, each with the power to multiply from its own seed. And so, 
It happened. The land flourished with grasses, every variety of seed bearing plant, and trees bearing fruit with their seeds in them. And God loved what he saw, for it was beautiful. Evening gave way to morning, the third day. Yes! <laughs> yes! That is so tough! Like, next time we're going to start a worship service, we're just going to put up a bunch of clips of mountains and shrubbery, right? Like, downstairs in our children, they're, they're talking about, they're talking about creation. And they've got plants on the stage. They've got real plants on the stage. They've got, they've got dirt. I, I think they even did a craft today with dirt. Isn't this awesome? Why? Because when you're a Christian, even dirt inspires worship. Wow. Brian Simmons, the author of the Passion Translation, this is what he has to say. The progress of creation moves from lower to the higher, from the darker to the brighter, from evening to morning. The Word of God put light into the darkness and land in the midst of the sea air in the midst of the water, and life in the midst of uninhabited earth. In creation, God started with form and then filled it with fullness. This is what we see, where there was once darkness, where there was once chaos, where there was once no order, now there is creation and a living ecosystem that is functional and beautiful. Beautiful. When you look at a flower, when you look at the crashing waves like our family just did, we went to see a seaside just prior to Thanksgiving, and you see those waves crashing, you say, those waves are tov. Why? Because those waves are doing what they were created to do. God created waves to crash upon the shores. If you were to go outside and across the street into May Creek Park and into the area that's called the Garden of Eden on on the maps and you were to look at these trees as they're stretching up into the skies, as they're stretching up, longing to be where they're called to be at the, uh, uh, up into the heavens and they're going up. Those trees are tav. Why? Because that's what trees were created to do. They were created to grow up and they were created to stretch forth their, their branches. When I look at my son, Peter, okay, who his whole life has had a pretty low voice. I got recordings of him even when he was just a a little, little boy, and, and his voice has always been so low. He just, he's, he's a baritone. And um, the funny thing about Peter is, is that when he starts laughing, I mean like really laughing, okay, he, um, uh, he, when he kind of loses control when he's laughing, his voice goes from being a low baritone voice to being a real high, high, high voice. And, 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 and he's just laughing uncontrollably. It's this real high, high, high laugh. And when he laughs like that, it's, it's so euphoric for me. When I hear him laugh like that, a part of me just settles back and settles in. Why? Because that is so tough. Little boys were created to laugh uncontrollably controllably to be able to enjoy environments with their, with their family. That anytime you look and you see anything from a tree to a wave to our incredible mountain Rainier, you see something that is tall because it takes you back to the beginning. It takes you back to your origin point. It takes you back to the thing that really, really, really matters. And that is for God so loved the world that he sent his own only begotten son to redeem you, to restore you, and to awaken you to your identity and to the reality that regardless of what your parents told you, you are not a mistake. That in eternity past, God knew you, he formed you, that before all of this, before even mountains stink and rain near, he knew my son Peter, he knew him intimately, and at the perfect moment 
in human history, God sent Peter's spirit into the womb where he began to weave together the DNA of Darren and the DNA of Andrea, weaving together this beautiful boy for the earth. And Andrea and I have the honor of stewarding the soul, the spirit, and the body of this beautiful boy, knowing that he is a gift from God. And that boy is so tough. He's beautiful and he's functional and he's, 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 he's learning new things all the time. In many areas, Peter's far smarter than I am. But I could still beat him up. <laughs> that in all of these things, there are all of these reminders that you have a God and that he is good and that he is a father. And that in eternity past, our great father took all of these realities that he cradled in his own heart and then he spoke spoke them into being, carving them into a reality. Why? Because of love for his sons and daughters that he would speak into this womb called the earth. I was at activation school uh, this morning at our at our hangout, and we were we were talking, and and um, and and I was I was getting to ramble for a little bit, and and I was and, and, and we were just kind of talking through some things, and and I think one of the things that the church is is waking up to is that we've got to get away from this idea or theology or belief system that says the earth is evil, and we need to get the heck off this thing because this earth looks so much like hell. We need to get away from that idea. Why? Because Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Lord, let your kingdom come. Father, holy Father who art in heaven, you know, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven heaven. We've, we've got to get away from this idea that, man, we, we, like, I cannot wait for the day when we all die and we go uh, to be with Jesus in heaven. And we need to wake up to the reality that the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, that this glorious, holy, beautiful, this Tav spirit of Christ Jesus himself is residing inside of you and I. Therefore, while Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos have dreams to terraform Mars because they've given up on the earth, it's time for the bride of Christ to wake up and to realize that we've been called to terraform the earth. We've been called to change the atmosphere. We've been called to change the weather. We've been called to bring change to the church. We've been called to bring change to the family structure. We've been chain, called to bring change to the governmental structure, and we don't have to go at it alone. In fact, Jesus said, you don't do nothing yet. You don't do nothing until you receive the great power from the helper, which is glorious Holy Spirit, because he'll be inside of you, and he will help you, and he will reveal to you all truth, and he'll convict you of sin, and he'll show you what you ought to do, and he'll give you dunamis power, super violent, supernatural ability to do what you could never do in and of yourself. You guys, the Lord has taken us to the future by taking us back to the past, because the blueprint is in Genesis 1. The blueprint is in Genesis 1, that he has created us, he has redeemed us, he has restored us, because redeemed people bring forth redemption, and restored people bring forth restoration. And God has redeemed us and restored us to bring forth redemption and restoration of not just people, but all nouns, people, places, things, cities, communities, and even the environment. I think it's so sad that the environment is so political. Why? Because whatever becomes political just becomes a big mess. Politics just goofs everything up. You know what the environment needs? Government. And where do you find undefiled government? In the heart of God and in the kingdom of God. I'll tell you what our environment needs. You know, greenhouse gases, global warming, or no global warming. We need a kingdom people that will say, this is my rock, this is my earth, this is my planet, and I'm going to take care of it more than any Republican, more than any Democrat. This is mine. I want the keys back. I'm sorry the tree huggers don't get the keys. Why? The keys have already been given to the sons of God. Now... <laughs> 
my Bible, I don't know if your Bible says this, but my Bible says that all of creation is groaning and waiting in a state of travail for the sons of God to be awakened to the reality of who they are, where they are, what they've been called to do. And I can't help but think that to a great degree, most Christians in America have been duped into thinking that Christianity is where you attend church on Sunday, you don't drink, you don't chew, you don't hang out with those who do, you vote Republican, you eat bread with lots of seeds in it, you recycle, you be moral, okay, and one day you'll die, and then you'll be happy and glorious, and you'll go to be with heaven. Let me tell you something, Christianity is a whole lot more than attending a meeting every Sunday and sitting in a blue chair and writing a tithe check. I am telling you, I am telling you this, Jesus did not live his, his life with a, with a rule book. He lived his life out of constant relationship and intimacy with a real daddy who he knew, and who he knew knew him. I am telling you that God is not saying to America that once you follow the rules, I'll send revival. God is saying to America, why don't you believe in what my son did on the cross? And why don't you believe that my son not only died, he resurrected from the dead. He is alive and his spirit is inside of you. The only thing keeping the church from revival, miracles, outpouring, and the radical supernatural is a thing called your brain. This thing right between your ears that always wants to convince you that you're not doing enough. That you need to do more. And that God is disappointed with you because you're not measuring up. But that's a religious lie from the pit of hell. I got good news that on the cross, Jesus declared, it is finished. And he said it to death. He said that to sin. He said that to injustice. It is finished. And the Lord is looking. I believe that the eyes of God are looking for a generation who will say, I don't really believe, but I acknowledge that. Forgive me of my unbelief. I want to believe. I want to disengage with disappointment. I don't want to be tethered to disappointment. I don't want to be tethered to ridiculous theology that was framed out just 100 years ago by a white guy. I would rather find something in the Word of God. It says it here. Jesus paid for it. Therefore, I don't have to. How much, Jesus, how much does healing cost? Jesus says, I don't know, my son paid for it. Hey, G- Jesus, how much does resurrection from the dead cost? What are you asking me to pay for? You know, you'll have to go and ask my son. The eyes of God are searching the globe for a generation that says, I believe for such a time as this. God has called us to bring order out of the chaos, to bring light out of the darkness, to bring division where there's madness and to make some sense out of all of this. It's going to take a body. It's going to take a people. It's going to take a company. It's going to take a people that are not just connected in the natural, but that are connected to the spirit. It's going to take a people that say, hey, hey, God just told me, yeah, well, that's funny, he just told me the same thing. Yeah, because we got the same God. Hey, Pastor Darren, I need to say this. I need to say this right now in a service in the microphone. What, what's he saying? Yep, I already got that. And everybody else that's listening, they got it too. Why? We got the same God. We've got the same dad. We've got the same Lord, and that's why he's gathered you and I together for such a time. You do not need my permission. I cannot be your savior. SRC cannot be your savior. I cannot be your middleman to get to Jesus. This church cannot be your middleman. You are going to have to know him for yourself. You're going to have to open the Bible for yourself. You're going to have to search the scriptures for yourself. Does Genesis say any of this, or is Pastor Darren just making it up? You're just going to take my word for it, or are you going to open your Bible and search the word? What does the Bible say, and what is God telling you in it? I'm t- God's saying one thing to me. He wants to say one thing to you. We're, we're, going, we're going the same place, but you've got to carve out your faith for yourself. I don't know what, what's coming next year. I believe some good things are coming next year. I believe some crazy things are coming next year. I think some glory is coming next year. I think some freaky, deaky, demonic stuff is coming next year. And this is what I know. You're going to have to know God for yourself. You're going to have to have your own faith. I'm telling you, your mommy's faith is not going to cut it next year. And you don't want your mommy's faith to cut it. You need your own faith. You need to know who God is. Is. You need to know what his voice is. Will it be easy? I doubt it. Will it be hard? Most likely. Will it be worth it? I promise you. So if you are willing to say, yes, God is calling me to bring forth environments that last, environments that are fruitful but are also beautiful. I want to make a covenant with my beautiful God to partner with him to see things that are beautiful and effective and efficient that I want my life to be about bringing forth creative, elegant, 
beautiful things and beautiful people. I want to give my life to that. If, if you're here and you're like, I'm kind of done with religion, but I'm all about the Tav. I'm all about making, you know, you know presidents and, and these guys. We're going to make America great again. We're going to, you know, look, like, what does that even mean? America doesn't need to be great again. The earth needs to be Tav again. Because when I look at America and when I look at our country, and when I look at our systems, it is not Tav. It is not driven by the fuel of love. It is driven by the fuel of vanity and selfishness. It is time for a kingdom company to do the right thing, not because they want Instagram likes. They do the right thing because they've made a covenant with the heart of God that he is cradling realities that he wants to carve and release. But the only way he speaks onto the earth these days is through his sons. Isaiah said it like this. The prophets will, de will declare a thing, and it will be established. It's time for the church to come up into their identity as kings and priests. Because we've created a lot of not, we've, the church is responsible for more COSEC environments. The church is responsible for more tohu vavohu environments in America than we are for tav environments. And it's time for us to be able to discern, to discern between the tohu vavohu and the tav. Because as for me in this house, in your house, in my house, as for us in our environments, as for us in our souls, we're all about the tough. It's so tough. Okay. Jump, jump, jump onto your feet. Uh. I'm going to declare the tough of God over your 2022. I want you to brood in 2022. Is that good? Our God hovers over time and over space. And I want you to ask the Lord to speak into your new year. I want him to speak into your next year. And we're going to frame it now. We are not going to be victims of tragedy next year. We're going to forge victory into the year. Get comfortable. Assume the position. I declare the beauty, the purity, the glory, the righteousness of Christ Jesus over you, over your heart, over your soul, over your spirit, over your marriage, over your family, and over your children from now up into next year. And I declare the Tav, which is the justice of God, which is the peace of God, which is the, the shalom of God, which is the prosperity of God, into every drawer, into every closet, into every area of your life that in any sort of corner where it's felt like things have been out of control, I see the living, breathing spirit of self-control coming into your life to regain control and to regain the atmosphere and dynamics of your home that have been just outside of the light. And I declare the courage of Christ Jesus to come inside of you and to go into every corner where there is not light, to go into every closet where there is not light, to bring forth the government of heaven. And I declare the Tav of the Lord into your January and February and March. I declare this to be a season of planting and sowing, a season of expectation and preparation. I declare the Tav of the Lord into your April, your May, and your June. I declare this to be a season of, of shifting and changing and even relocation. And I see for some of you, your children are going to move back into the area to be with you. And for some of you, you're going to move out of the area even to be with your children. But it's going to be a, se a season of a and preparation for what God is going to do in the future, which is going to be a, a season of family and families running together, yep, to partner together to see things established. I declare to your June and your July and your August, the Tav of the Lord, a season of launching, a season of, of, of sending, a season of refreshing, a season of rest, and even things that you lost in 2020 and 2021, even things that, 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 that felt like they were removed from you, even dreams that felt like they shattered and you wondered if you had missed it. I see the summer months being a time of restoration that God is going to restore with the enemy thought that he had successfully stolen and I see restoration and recompense I see you going into the fall and I just declare to the September and October 
in November. I just declare in that time an expectation, uh, yep, 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 of, 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 of domination. And I see promotion. And I, I don't mean evil, tyrant domination. I see this place of, of executing kingdom realities with a fresh authority because of what you learned in 2020 and 2021. I feel like the Lord says, I have tested you. I have tried you in these previous seasons. For many of you, you felt like you were going through a fire. But during this time, even from a year from now, that you're going to be in this place where you've been tested and you've been tried and gold will remain. And the Lord says, for many of you, you'll step into a place of promotion because of the severe testing and the, and the trials even of your faith, even in, in 2020 and 2021. And I see you coming into a place of manifestation. I see you coming into a place of promotion. I see you coming into a place of the word that does domination, this place where you take dominion. So I thank you, Father, for the grace, the grace on each and every person here to, to, to begin to stand and to not grow weary in doing good, but to continue standing. Even if they cannot see, I hear the Lord say, close your eyes and stand. Even if you can't see what is before you, close your eyes and stand firm. Stand firm. Even if you don't know what the future holds, close your eyes and stand firm. Do not become weary in doing good. For it's hard, it's difficult, but it's tough. And God is at work in your body, your soul, and your spirit. The first service, the Lord spoke to me and said, I am removing blockages. And I believe that he's removing blockages, even in our intimacy with connection with Father. I also believe that he's, he's removing blockages, even in our ability to communicate with each other. But I also believe that there's an anointing here to even remove physical blockages, even in people's arteries and even in people's hearts. So I declare right now, even in this room, that people's hearts are being healed of emotional issues and damage, but even, um, even people's hearts are being healed, even from heart attacks that they've suffered in the past, that even blockages in people's arteries and veins are being healed right now. Go God, go God, right now, 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 flush it out, flush it out, flush it out, flush it out. I declare even plaque in people's arteries that disappearing by the grace of God, that it would not even stay in the artery, but it would disappear, that it would disintegrate right now. And I just declare, you're going to need a healthy heart where God is taking you, where God is bringing you in these next days. It's going to require an emotionally free heart and a strong physical heart. And now we declare to the heart of Seattle Revival Center, we declare peace be unto you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We remove and break all trauma over the heart and heartbeat of Seattle Revival Center. We thank you, Lord. Even in the past, you protected the heart of this bride. You protected the heart of this church. And even when the enemy came to stop the heartbeat of this house, Lord, you took your hand and you wrapped your hand around the heart of this church and you preserved the heart of this church. As the heart beats hard and as the heart beats strong, Father, we ask for wisdom to protect the heart and the heartbeat of Seattle Revival Center. That no matter what opportunity or no matter what tragedy we face as a community, we pray, Lord, that the DNA of this body would be preserved, would be safe, that the heart, the heartbeat, the four chambers of the heart would be protected by the mighty hand of mighty God. We thank you, Father, for what you are downloading into our spirits in this time. For surely you're doing something that our imagination is not yet perceived of. Lord, we bless your holy name in Jesus' name. Everybody said? God bless you. God bless you. Listen, if you need prayer for anything today, we have a ministry team that would love to pray for you. Just come on up to the front. Our ministry team will love you and pray for you. Otherwise, tonight we're going to be back at 6 o'clock for, our, um, for our, uh, our Christmas service, our Advent service. And it starts at 6, and we'll be talking about um, Christ our love. So if you like Christmas, if you like Jesus, if you know some pagans, bring them along. See you tonight at 6 p.m. Love you guys.